Hi, I'm Melody Walker, and this is How to Live a Life, the startup edition, and this is episode two. And I'm Nicholas Saul from Etron Electric Motorbikes, and this is my startup. Nicholas, you've got a big background in cars. Now you're in motorbikes. Now, you've had a few problems along the line trying to get this particular business going. Tell me your story. This has not been an easy venture, I have to tell you. Yeah, I'm 30 years in the motor industry prepared me for very little, as it turned out. All my partners, all the ex-mud industry guys. So we've got a combined 120 years in the mud industry. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to start representing our own brand rather than the brands we'd represented over the decades. Um, and we looked for a product that we could introduce into the country that would allow us a unique gap, um, a niche market we could explore. Um, and we settled on motorcycles rather than cars. Um, due to the cost of the bringing motor vehicles into South Africa versus motorcycles is obviously more expensive mm. based on the nature of the product. Um, the EV um, decision was born out of the fact that we knew that the motor industry was going to be moving into the EV sector. Um, so we started exploring the opportunities to find EV motorcycles. Um, we looked at a couple of different op options um, initially and didn't find anything that really suited us. We did find a manufacturing partner we could work with and then also we started designing our own bike, which took us a couple of years. So the, the venture started off at quite a good pace. Um, the R&D we put into the bike got more and more um, uh, involved and more and more intricate. Um, and ultimately we finished a product three years ago. We got a product ready for market and then unfortunately for us, COVID came along and you know, kind of stopped us in our tracks. So a big setback for us, the fact that our manufacturers were closed, um, the R&D we put into the bike stood still for a year effectively, and then our single biggest issue over that period was funding. You know, we'd gone from a situation where we were reasonably well geared to be able to design, manufacture, import and distribute a product to where we'd pretty much drained all of our resources coming out of, um, coming out of COVID. Are people actually quite keen to get into the funding of electric vehicles? The, the perception is that you know the EV market is, is a space that everybody wants to get involved in. Um, the institutions particularly all show the best intentions of wanting to get involved in a new technology. Um, an urban transport solution is a great investment, again, depending on where you're going to get your money. Mm. Um, we struggled a little bit because of the nature of the, the fact that we had a product that was an unknown quantity in a market that was untested. Um, so there was a lot of um, apprehension around venturing with us. Um, so the traditional banks were looking for massive equity, um, both in ownership of the business, and then also like all institutions inevitably do, they wanted some big sureties. Mm. You know, we had managed to pretty much sell everything we owned early on to keep the, you know, to keep the, the fires going, so to speak. We funded all of the initial R&D ourselves, which was expensive. And you know, after three years, you've kind of drained all your own resources, you've sold all the properties you've got, you've sold all the cars you own. Um, you've cashed in every pension, every medical aid, you know, has been cancelled. So you're utilising every cent you've got. And it gets to a point where, out of desperation, you start taking on um, financing options that you really shouldn't be, you know. But um, we were very, very fortunate in finding an institution that was very much out of the box in terms of the way they think. They bought into the concept of the product. They invested in the in the management of the product rather than the product itself. Mm. You know, it took a lot of belief for somebody to say, right, you know, it's not a small amount of money you need. It's a tried, it's not a tried or tested product. It's coming into a market where nobody really knows how it's going to perform. Um, so while they evaluated the product well, I think their belief and their faith and their investment was more in the management team than it was in the, in the bike itself. Mm -hmm. Obviously you're going to sell the bikes and that will bring money back in mm. again. But what are the other ways that you're actually managing to get money in using the bikes? So the best way for us to be able to do it was to not be one dimensional in terms of bringing in a motorcycle that will be sold to retail consumers. You know, that's just the one, the one avenue. Because of the nature of the bike and some of the R&D we've been doing, we understood that our bike was quite unique in terms of the shape of the bike. Um, we also did some um, research and development in terms of an LED lighting pack on the bike. So we ended up turning the bikes into mobile billboards. From a mobile media point of view, we understood that the bikes could generate more than just a first gross income. So a first gross income is traditionally just the sale of a bike. Mm. What we wanted to be able to do was attract franchisees, guys who wanted to buy the bikes, and give them a second source of income outside of just the one-dimensional buying and selling of motorcycles. 
So we redesigned the bike, um, we fitted an LED light pack to it which is completely unique. We started off with an LED safe, a rider safety light which is just on top of the bike which obviously gives the riders a lot more um, visibility at night. Mm. We then expanded the LED pack to encompass the entire bike. So now you've got a all singing, all dancing campaign on the bikes effectively which allows the, the, the franchisees to rent bikes out on a daily basis on a tourism model, so to speak. So if you're down in Cape Town, you're Durban, even in Joburg, the inner city tours, the guys are now buzzing around on our carbon neutral electric motorcycles. So while they're getting a daily rental, they're also getting a media income to back up their daily rental, which subsidizes the entire cost of ownership of a franchise. So you've got your retail sale income, you've then got a media income, and then you've got a daily rental income, which makes our franchise a lot more attractive than a standard bike. Have you been having problems with people going, well, it's an electric bike, it needs to be charged, and of course we are having load shedding hitting us once again? It's, I think, you know, South Africa is not unique in the fact that um, there's energy problems. Um, you know, all over the planet at the moment, guys are suffering from, you know, in an energy crisis. All you need to do is plan your trips around the load shedding. I mean, typically a bike will charge from zero to 100% in three hours and it can charge incrementally. So hypothetically, if you're leaving home and going to the office on the bike, you're either charging at home or at the office. And what about after sales service? I mean, you know, if they need to get new parts for the bike? We carry an extensive range of parts. The, the nice thing about this product is we design a product specifically for South Africa. Um, in terms of servicing the bike, we've got very few service items. Part of the research and development we did on the bike was to cut down on the number of components in the bike and we also upgraded the quality of the components. We're about three or four years into this venture now, so where are you at this stage? Well, we're fortunate now. We, we overcome our funding issues um, successfully. We've got a really good um, uh, venture group that's backed us. Um, it's allowed us the freedom to be able to focus more on R&D than, than surviving. Um, so we've got 150 bikes in country at the moment, which we're about to launch. Um, we've got shops opening up in uh, Durban, we've got a showroom opening up in Cape Town and obviously the Parkhurst operation we've got set up. Um, what we are exploring now is to make us a little bit more sustainable or self-sustainable. We've designed a solar panel which we're going to start selling along with the, with the bikes, which will make it a real eco uh, carbon neutral um, product from, you know, from start to finish, which means you can charge off solar at home or at the office, depending where you do the installation. And of course, why shouldn't we have everything going solar these days? We've got so much sun in South Africa. Absolutely, absolutely. So where are you going to take it further in the future? We've got a lot of opportunities from an export point of view. We've got a lot of demand for the bike in, on some of the holiday islands like Mauritius. You know, Mauritius is a prime example in terms of uh, a, a need to be eco, uh, to be carbon neutral. You know, the island itself is very um, proactive in terms of looking for carbon neutrality. Motorcycles are quite popular on the island, but trying to find a sustainable motorcycle is where we come in. And again, the added value of being able to have a marketing income or a media income on the bikes on a holiday island like that makes a franchise operation in Mauritius absolutely ideal. Well, we're searching South Africa for new startup ideas. So if you have one, do send us an email at this address right here. So boop that button and subscribe.